Hey everybody, Zach here, and we are talking all about supporting students with disabilities today in this quick little screencast. And so the goal of this screencast is teachers will better understand inclusive practices for students with disabilities. Now, again, the course, remember, is all about all of our students, right? But in being and having a course that's about all students, we know that special education is a part of that all. And oftentimes, special education is a part of that all that has been left out of the all. So that might have been confusing. But the big idea here is if we're going to talk about all kids, we need to talk about students with disabilities and how to support them really well. And so I'm going to have you pause this video and I want you to think about where you're at with this goal and whether or not you're in a spot where you need more support, where you're starting to understand or where you're ready to implement. Feel free to pause it and think for yourself or um, reflect in some way. Awesome. So again, the value of all, leaning on the side of access over exclusion. So the reason that I'm talking about leaning on the side of access over exclusion is because in our historical models, that one size fits all approach where there's one way to represent concepts there's one way or a singular way to keep kids engaged. There's one way for kids to show what they know. Oftentimes in that type of a design, you would move towards exclusion over access, meaning like a kid that doesn't fall in line with that singular path up the mountain, that kid, well, they're not appropriate for this setting because they don't fit on that path. Let's find a different setting with a path that's appropriate for them, right? Because that setting has more of a singular path. Now, I get that the word singular path is too simple for how even today or yesterday's classrooms are. We still had some good practices going on. We still had teachers that were differentiating and adapting content and making things as accessible as they could be. The thing that I'm trying to say is it was still really limited. The system was still designed with a very narrow view in mind of how a student accesses. And with that design as your primary value, when learners fall outside the scope of your design, they become a liability. They become something that requires all this extra work to come around and grab and support. The game has changed. The model has changed. Now we're talking about a model that is inclusive in its very nature and says that it is successful when it can include as many learners as possible. And the way that it designs for success is by providing multiple paths up the mountain, okay? So in a place that designs multiple paths up the mountain, you want learners that are dynamic in that space because it's a learning space and it wants you to inform new paths up the mountain, right? Like if success is, I know how to teach this in a bunch of ways, you're going to want kids in your classroom that force you to try new things and teach in new ways. Does that make sense? Because that's how the system is designed. That's the, that's the design. That's the primary value of the system. That is universal design for learning. We would lean on the side of access, not only because it's the right thing to do, but also because it provides more like a learner that, 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 that is challenging to teach, a learner that pushes you is a learner that you're going to learn the most from and is going to inform your design skills more so than a learner that you don't really have a challenge in teaching. Oftentimes people identify students with disabilities as being challenging to teach. Whether we agree with that stereotype or not, the reality is any kid that pressure tests us is a kid that we should welcome within our classroom and we should always have a bend of access in a universally designed classroom because we're always wanting to get better and learn more paths up the mountain. Hopefully that makes sense, but let's keep moving through. Hopefully you'll get some more information on it. So general education and special education, two sides of the same coin. The big idea around this is to just think of like every kid is a general education student. Every kid, right? Like we are, special education is services. Even specialized academic instruction in a separate setting is considered a service, right? We oftentimes call our SPED kids SPED kids, when the reality is our every kid that we serve in a public education classroom or in a public education school is a general education student first. And sh we should always have a lean towards the least restrictive environment be for that reason, because of the whole idea that separate is not equal. And so how do you do that is obviously the billion dollar question 
But first, we need to understand that we are talking about two sides of the same coin. We're talking about the same coin being this is a general education student and that needs or requires special education services. So here's a handy little infographic that I built for teachers out in Sanger. The middle part of this graphic is helpful. We're not going to cover much of it, but if you are experiencing a student that is challenging you or that is pressure testing your educational or instructional design, then these questions can help inform you for better supports around what a student needs. And notice these questions are also not blaming questions because oftentimes we can get frustrated with the student and we go to blaming or like, or, or saying all the things they can't do as opposed to listing the things they can. These questions can help you because they push you to a space where you have to think about them from a design lens and not just a barrier like my kids can't do this lens. So that is this part that we're not going to talk a lot about. But here I want to key in on this idea of, again, two sides of the same coin. We have general education supports and then special education supports. General education supports really are based around universal design for learning. We're trying to design a general education experience that is inclusive in its very nature and supportive of any kid that walks through the door. So that by, by and large, most of our students get supported in general education because it's so flexible and accessible. We know, though, that there are times where some students still need specific interventions and supports and services. That's where special education comes in or even MTSS model comes in to give those kids the, what they need and to support them where they need supports because we know that there's always going to be kids that pressure test us beyond what we can handle within the universal design for learning scope. That's what we're talking about right now. So let's first go to general education because that is really important. If we don't have this figured out and we start here, oftentimes we're building supports for an individual kid that we can solve with just a tweak in the universal access piece. So let's jump there first. As we always say, universal design for learning, the UDL guidelines guide everything within a universally designed setting. They give us all the information we need for how to provide multiple access points for a learner and to remove barriers related to engagement or representation or action expression for learners. And when we have a place that's designed really well with UDL in mind, sorry, I'm just talking with my hands and shaking my head. Hopefully it's not distracting. Uh, a screencasting is always exciting, but where we design with multiple paths in mind, we promote access because a kid can find a path that works for them or at least a path that works better for them than a one size fits all approach. So this still does require ongoing collaboration with special education. General education teachers need to see themselves as special education teachers. Special education teachers need to still see themselves as general education teachers. We have to be able to cross over and talk to each other in order for this to work. And even from a tier one perspective, we can always learn how to better inform tier one by talking with practitioners that work with kids that tier one is having a challenge to support, right? So that's some big idea there on um, working with SPED. Contribution and implementation of GE supports within IEP. So a great thing about universal design for learning is it does give special, our general education teachers, general education practitioners, a lot of language that they then can take into an IEP because they can talk about the representation that's, representations that the kid responds to really well. They can talk about the engagement strategies and the collaboration strategies and the goal setting strategies and progress monitoring strategies that really support their engagement. They can talk about the um, tools that they find themselves seeing the kid use all the time and should probably be built into the IEP or built into, in California, we have what's called designated supports or accommodations for our big state test. So a, a general education teacher can just as much inform that IEP as the special education teacher in a universally designed environment because, again, choice is built into the environment and the general education teacher has seen how the student with disabilities is interacting and making choices in that learning environment. And then data collection should also be a part of all kids' experience, not just kids on IEPs, right? So we're talking SMART goals, SMART. I'll, I'll get that acronym. I always forget. It. It's like relevant, time-bound, 
specific measurable. Um, um, I don't remember the A. I will get all that information it was, <laughs> and I'll post it on our little spot. Um, behavioral intervention, inclusion plans, all of those data should not just be housed in special education land. General education should be part of that conversation as well. And team members, general education teacher, principal, we have curriculum support to providers. You might have VPs. All of these people who historically have not been a part of the special education conversation should have things to add in a universally designed general education experience. So that was a lot of words. Let's slow it down for a minute and use an analogy to show what we're trying to get at when we're talking about universal design and general education and how it supports students with disabilities. First and foremost, before I even go to the analogy, because it's a dangerous analogy because it really is practical and, and, and makes sense, right? We should mine, literally pull, and try to go as deep as we can in accommodation land with a UDL lens before we ever go into a modification land and we change the goal. Meaning, UDL says there's one goal and there's a bunch of ways to do or achieve that goal. First, as a practitioner within general education or as a special education teacher that's supporting inclusion and access, Always, always, always work on finding routes to that learning objective. And hopefully you know what I'm talking about. We did the, um, we just did the uh, UDL lesson planning day. But we're finding routes first, right? Where we cannot find a route, where it is not appropriate, this specific goal, right, at the top of the mountain. Let's say the goal is being able to read a 12th grade text and identify the theme and support that theme in a four paragraph essay. I don't know, I'll make it better. If we know we have a learner that is just not there. There is not a route that this kid can climb. There's not a tool that's gonna to promote full access as of right now. What a helpful analogy we can think about is that a UDL lesson is like a really complex recipe. Think of this as like a delicious cake, right? Let's see if these are work, right? The recipe for a delicious cake. This is a bun cake, I believe. My wife would know better than I would, but it is. it looks delicious, and I'm really good at eating them. So we've got brown sugar. We've got flour. We have raisins. We have some sort of fruit. We have eggs. We have sugar. We have chocolate. We have all these things being mixed together to create this amazing, delicious cake. Think of that as the universally designed lesson. Think of that as all these experiences related to theme, all these videos that are making theme really clear. We have a deep text that has all these tools like text-to-speech and highlighting, e-text, of course, and the ability to access multiple types of text or have choice within text when you're identifying the theme. There is a big old table full of ingredients that build that universally designed theme lesson, right? Just like there's a big old table of ingredients that make this delicious cake. When we're talking modifications, UDL, our universally designed general education, provides us with a bunch of different recipe items that we can make a modified goal from. Meaning, we don't want the kid to just be way out in space. Way out in space means at the back table, working on a completely separate curriculum. We want to be able to take the ingredients of that universally designed lesson and just like what I do, like I can't make that cake. <laughs> My wife will tell you it would not turn out well. But what I can do is take like the flour, I can take the eggs, I can take some of the baking powder, I can take the sugar, and I can create pancakes, or I can create a more simple recipe utilizing the more complex ingredients. That's what we're doing when we're talking about modification land when we're and we're talking about universally designed lessons. A universal designed, a universally designed theme lesson, if you will, you got to think that's going to have videos of theme. That's going to have characters that have pictures of characters, videos of characters, and text representation of characters. That's going to have all sorts of different options for how kids express their understanding and express that essay. So maybe they speak it and it turns into text. Maybe there's an outline or graphic organizer that they use. Maybe there's some sort of fancy tool that they think and it writes it out for them. I don't know if that's been created yet, but I'm sure it's on its way. So we, you get what I'm saying. Like there's all these ingredients here within that lesson. So now if I have a kid, 
they're just not at a place where they're writing about theme from a 12th grade text. They still might be able to do theme from a video, which would be awesome. They still might be able to do a theme from a picture, which would be awesome. Again, it's a modified, it's a little less, it's a little further down the mountain. It's a, it's a plateau on the mountain, but not the peak. Um, or maybe it's a, we're going to say, okay, for theme is not appropriate for this student right now. We're going to look at character development. Well, in that universally designed lesson, we have a ton of interactions with characters because we have all these different representations of themes or stories that have characters deeply embedded in them. So again, I'm taking all those great components of the UDL lesson, and as a special education teacher or as a general education teacher, I'm able to take those and tailor that and say, okay, I'm going to use this, do this, this, and this, and that supports access or a prerequisite skill to this big peaks goal of, for the example I said was theme. All right, so hopefully that is helpful. Please leave a comment in the discussion box or, or send me a message if that's not clear, because I'd like to unpack that further if you don't understand it. So that's when we jump into special education. Again, really supportive, crazily designed. It's different now around um, general education and our tier one, so first best instruction, so that when kids really do still need specialized academic supports or when they need special education services, it's tailored for them. And the system isn't so overwhelmed over false positives or students that aren't actually needing these supports, that it can, it can meet their needs where they are. So special education. Um, again, checklists, pet cards, first thin charts, all those are helpful for individual students, and they might be employed on an individual basis for individual needs. That said, pay attention to what you learn from doing these, because a lot of this stuff is stuff that then will inform you to make better global supports. So, but for sure, there are times when, when this individual kid, when Zach needs a schedule chart, and it needs to be pictures, and it needs to be his that he has control over. Totally fine promotes access, allows them to swim in a universally designed environment. Special education is all about communication across service providers. So special education really needs to think critically about how it's communicating the needs of those individual students out to the professionals that serve those students. And I'm going to show you some tools here in a couple minutes that help with that. But I first need to, I can't underscore enough the importance of this communication process. Ongoing collaboration with GE sharing specific learning objectives. So again, in a universally designed experience, that general education teacher, unless it's a co-taught model, that general education teacher still has a lot on their plate because they're trying to design multiple paths and options towards a singular standard-based goal. Special education teachers need to be able to share specific learning objectives, especially when they're modified to that general education teacher in a proactive way, meaning before the kid walks to the classroom. Share what the goals are going to be for that kid and how those, that recipe that the general education teacher is working through, like which elements or ingredients of that recipe should be pulled and snapped in to create a learning experience that's meaningful for the student that might need a modified goal. Again, always try to exhaust those accommodated steps and an accommodated practice, but sharing what the objectives are and even what the path may be for a student towards meeting a standards-based learning objective. The communication really helps. Facilitation and implementation of SPAD supports within IEP. So the special education teacher should really be holding the line in making sure that the supports that are mentioned and listed that are laid out in the IEP are in fact being carried out in practice. That also, they need to be aware of what specific data related to the needs of that individual kid that might not be the general education teacher's primary responsibility. The case manager is taking charge of those, knows what those IEP goals are, knows what the data is related to those IEP goals, and is creating a plan, right, that is setting out the goals that actually will snap in to the inclusive space so that it promotes access. Here's what this means. There are times where we're teaching students and we're even like in the district that I've worked in where we looked at the IEP goals and we're like, 
every kid's meeting the IEP goals. They're killing it with the IEP goals. But then when you look at their progress on classroom assessments, state assessments, district progress, benchmarks, we're seeing these students are not making progress. So if they're meeting all their IEP goals but never making progress within the standards-based instruction, something's wrong. We need to go back and look at the goals and say, are these goals rigorous enough? Are they designed or tailored to the skills that we know that will provide access within general education? Special education teachers, case managers, even general education teachers need to constantly thinking about what are the skills this kid individually need, needs that would really, really be helpful and supportive of their experience within a universally designed classroom. So that happens from a special education perspective. The general education teacher doesn't know magic. We none of us know magic. We have to know what our roles are. We have to know what we're trying to do in terms of support and what the ultimate goals are for the family and the student so that then we can take those and snap them in place in a universally designed classroom or system. So the team members related to special education. Again, special education teacher service providers like um, uh, physical therapists, uh, occupational therapists, adaptive PE teachers, school psychologists, all of these team members are saying to the global system, to the tier one, to the first best instruction, hey, this kiddo, this Zach who needs supports, here are the supports that would really be beneficial. Here are the goals and skills that would be really helpful that would allow access to the standard-based instruction. All right, so again, we're talking about those tier three, even beyond the tiers of intervention. We're talking about the supports that are specific to individual kids and their individual needs. All right, so just a quick note around behavior. Reminder around like paying attention to what the behavior is communicating. We can spend some more time on this. I'm not gonna go deep here, but just as a reminder, like for our special education and general education practitioners, what is a behavior saying when a kid's exhibiting it, right? Meaning, what is the antecedent? What's the thing that happened before the behavior happened? What was the behavior itself? And then what is the consequence, the ABCs of behavior? What is the consequence for that behavior? Meaning, every piece of behavior, every time you see a decision or choice being made by a student, there is something that that choice is communicating. And so as practitioners, we have to be able to understand whether or not that's communicating that I want attention, I want stimulation, I want tangibles, I want escape. Just pay attention to what the behaviors your students are, uh, are exhibiting, what they're actually communicating, rather than just being frustrated by them. All right, so let's jump into some tools and resources that will help support this. And these will be linked as well as uh, in our um, module for this week, so you can have some tools listed out and some exemplars listed out. This is an example of a mainstreaming. So this was mainstreaming, right? And I'm not changing the word to inclusion plan because when I was writing this back in uh, 2012, we weren't allowed to call it inclusion, right? And to be full disclosure, like I was an SDC teacher trying to get inclusive practices put in place but um, the best we could do, the best I could move the system as a teacher was to get really robust mainstream set up, really robust um, uh, push in where I like had kids pushing into general education classrooms. That was the best I could do as an educator in a classroom teaching kids. That's ultimately what made me lose my mind and have to get out of the classroom to say, no, 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 like we can do better. I need to design or be a part of the group that designs a, a change to the system so that we can actually have true inclusion. But that mainstreaming word was still there and it, it it's all, it, it, I'm not gonna lie to you, this specific example comes out of a mainstreaming experience because you gotta move from where you are. You gotta build inclusive experiences from the spheres of influence that you have. So if you're a teacher and you have to call this stuff mainstreaming, call it mainstreaming, do it, put it in place and make it build each and every year. If you're someone that's in leadership and you have the ability to build, give people more tools related to inclusion, 
to actually call it inclusion, then do it so that we can stop using these funny words and start just building access for kids. But that word there on the top was something that oh, I hated writing it, full disclosure. Um, but I'm happy that I left it in here. I honestly forgot that I did, but I wanted you to know why, because I was a teacher trying to do the best I could in the system that I was in to try to build more access points for my students. And um, now we're, we're gonna keep doing that. And hopefully at some point this just becomes inclusion. These are inclusion plans for our students. All right, so I'll get off that soapbox and get back into the tool itself. This is something that should be happening prior to the universally designed experience, prior to the lesson. Having a time where the general education teacher and the special education education teacher collide and connect and do some planning. This can be 10 minutes, honestly. This can be 30 minutes. This can be done before school, after school. It's now going to be, it's awesome because it can be done digitally where this tur gets turned into a Google Doc. The general education teacher communicates when they're going to fill it in. Special education teacher communicates when they're going to fill it in. And then it's ready for when the kids go into the classroom. It's ready for when they're being supported. So let's look at the, what the general education teacher fills in in the template like this. So the general education teacher gives the team what the objectives are going to be for all students that week. What are the learning goals going to be? So students will learn to plan a story using a graphic organizer. Students will begin to draft, use a flowchart and transition words. Students will complete vocabulary worksheet. That's what the general education teacher gave me. These are actually from real life, real life classroom. And now the special education teacher is going to say, here's what inclusion, here's what access looks like for the student that's in your classroom coming from the special education service area. So students will learn to plan a story using a graphic organizer. Students will have a choice of drawing, writing, or typing out their story. Students will begin to draft using a flowchart and transitional words. Students will complete vocabulary worksheet. Notice some of these goals are a direct carryover. So I'm communicating to the general education teacher, hey, like the schools that are for your class that that you that you that for for all kids are that applies to all kids. That applies to the kid that's walking into your door. That applies to the kid that we're including um, who has some more intensive support needs. But notice up here, I'm giving, showing that, really highlighting that idea of choice. And this is a great example too. So the format carries through, like use the format. But here in a universally designed class, why would I even need to have this whole little caveat sentence of students have choice of drawing, writing, or typing out their story? That would be embedded into a universally designed system. And so maybe we don't even need this form for this specific group of kids or this specific kid. The idea remains the same though. We say, okay, general education, communicate what the learning objective is here. And then special education teachers communicate what the modified or accommodated support needs are here. Now we have a plan moving forward that the team has for the week. We also have this little spot where it's like uh, uh, information on accommodation modifications. That was a helpful tool. The really important thing to think about in a tool like this is that it has to be simple. And special education teachers, case managers, I'm talking to you because we have a tendency to be way more complex than we need to. And all the general education teacher wants to know is how do I promote access? How does my kids, how does this kid, and I like the word, how does my kid, right, that has, my, how does my kid that receives special education services, how do they access what I'm trying to teach them for the week? What things do I need to know about their needs for the week? Keep it simple so that then the general education teacher doesn't get overwhelmed because in their mind, they're constantly thinking about, yeah, but I've got 30 kids. Yeah, but I've got 30 kids to support. So the more simple you can make it, the more happy they will be and the more likely it'll be that the plan gets carried out. All right, so let's talk just for a minute about the IEP. This is an IEP, example of an IEP that we do out in Sanger or out in um, the state of California. And the thing that I wanna really highlight is that our general education teachers that we work with really need to understand what the learning goals are. They also need to understand what the accommodations are. And this is an old version of the accommodations page but we need to be communicating clearly what the accommodations are that are gonna promote success for that student, taking them from the IEP, 
making sure that the teacher understands them, put them in front of them. I have some tools that will be listed again in that resource section this week that you can peruse that help do this. But the goals and the accommodations are imperative. The whole IEP is imperative. The goals and the accommodations are really imperative. And oftentimes the general education teacher in looking at the forest forgets to zoom in and look at these two elements that are really helpful for them in understanding how to, what the kid actually needs for access. So these sets of documents then create a cycle that feed each other. So now we're saying, okay, special education teacher, with this in mind, you're giving the SPAD learning objectives. General education teacher, you're informing the special education teacher of the needed skills, accommodations, supports that should go into the IEP. We're saying that this then creates that cycle where the general education teacher sees their relevance to the IEP and the special education teacher isn't building IEPs out in space, but they're building IEPs that connect to the needs of the kid related to the classroom. We need parts of the system that are talking to each other. All right, so support plans, holistic teaming, we're bringing everybody into it, making sure that we have IEP connections within those weekly plans, and then we're making sure that it's ongoing collaboration. In order for an inclusive setting to work, it has to really be ongoing, the types of communication and collaboration that's happening within that place so that students have access and that it's prepared before they walk through the door. If you're always playing catch up, the students are ultimately going to suffer. And so if you can set that norm, if you can try to start small and work with one team, special education teacher, one grade level, one kind teacher, and start building that practice, building those things in year after year, you will create transformation in as little as four to five years. It will change things. I've seen it happen, and I've seen it happen both in my world, but also in the world of people around me. So um, I, this is the last little reminder that this all is going to take a growth mindset there is not going to be a perfect version of this. I'm going to give you a bunch of tools. And if you just take those tools and plug them in without ever thinking about how you would adapt them to their context, then they're not going to work. They're not going to make sense. The other thing too, is that if you forget, it's really about having a growth mindset around the relationships connected to this kid and less around creating some fancy tool or fancy template then you're going to have like a much better experience because again, the tools just feed and promote access to relationship. They build connection. If the tools are going to, if you think they're going to stand alone, it really isn't going to happen because it requires you to have thought and preparation and teaming to support inclusive environments. All right, so our goal was for teachers to better understand inclusive practices for students with disabilities. Hopefully you got a vision of that. I know this one was a little bit longer, but there was a lot to it. So next week we're gonna talk specifically about this teaming piece, but for now, this is where we're gonna pause, stop. Hopefully your goal was met. Take a minute to reflect on that.